the Lord. Hallelujah. This is Pastor Donald Wayne Dickman here once again. A blessed Sunday to all of you. I pray that you all are keeping well in the Lord. And I also pray that you're running the race faithfully with your eyes set on Jesus Christ. Today, my message is entitled, Not a Might Would I Withhold. And the text is taken from Genesis chapter 22 and also Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19. As we look at Genesis chapter 22, we will look at a very a familiar text, an incredible story, an incredible uh, a miracle here, in fact, that Abraham experienced. Uh, I'll read a few verses here. It says, and it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Today, I want to look at this text and talk about the testings that we go through in our life or the trials that we go through in our life. Many of us are facing all kinds of testing. Many of us are facing all kinds of trials. Some of us, in fact, are facing the hardest testing we ever faced in our entire life at this moment or the hardest trial that we ever faced we are facing now at this moment. And even as we look at this text, you realize something very similar because Abraham, I believe, faced one of the toughest or hardest trials that he ever faced in his life. And we're going to learn from Abraham today uh, about testing. What is what is the testings that God brings in our part? Why does he bring these testings? And what are the steps that we need to take that we will be able to ace these testings or go through these testings and come out more blessed, come out uh, with a closer walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, as we look at this text, you will see in Genesis chapter 22, very clearly he tells us that God instructed Abraham to take his only son, his only son here, he said very clearly, he said, take your only son whom you love us. And not Ishmael, very clearly he talks about Isaac and he wants him to go to Mount Moriah, the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. Burnt offerings. I mean, this, this is one of the worst testing that anybody can experience in their entire life. This is a child that Abraham was praying and his wife was praying for. And in their old age, miraculously, God blessed them with this son, uh, Isaac. And through this son, God said, that you will be a father of many nations. And now in chapter 22, God instructs him, God instructs him to go and take his son and sacrifice his son as a burnt offering in the land of Moria in one of the mountains. And today I want to talk about the steps that we need to take so that we will be successful, we will pass, we will ace the test that we go through, the trials that we go through, and we will come out more blessed with a greater reward. First, I'm going to talk about the testings in the Bible, because here, very clearly, we see here, the Bible is saying it's not something that I'm interpreting, or I've used some, some commentaries or whatever to get some, some direction from it, but very specifically, it says, by faith, when God tested him in, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, he says sometime later, God tested Abraham. So very clearly here, this was a test that God brought upon Abraham. This is a test that you and I go through many times in our life, at many junctures or, 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 or in our journey, and many parts in our journey, we will experience different tests, like how we go to school. We experience different tests to ensure we have learned and we understand what we have learned so far so that we can progress to the different level. And as we, 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 we score in those exams, we will get can afford to go to another level and even in our university studies or your postgraduate studies and you can be used out there in the working world or in the ministry but all of us go to testing and through this testing we learn things and one of the greatest 
testings is the testings we experience in life itself, the school of hard knocks, we call it, in fact. So as we look at the Bible, I want to talk about testing first before I address the steps we take so that we will be an overcomer. We will go to this testing successfully victorious here. In, in Psalm chapter 66, verse 10, he says, For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, it says very clearly, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patient experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. In Job chapter 23, verse 8 to 10, he says, If I go east, he is not there. If I go west, I cannot perceive him. In verse 9, he says, when he is at work to, to, to the north, I could I cannot see him. When he turns south, I cannot see him. Yet he knows the way I have taken. When he has tested me, I will emerge as pure gold. One of the metaphors that the Bible says about life is that it is a test. Life, it is a test. We go through many tests in our life and through that we develop and we grow. God continuously tests people's character. God uh, tests our faith, our obedience, our love, our integrity, our loyalty. Character is both developed and revealed by testing. And the truth of the matter is, all of life is a test, as I explained just now. All of life is a test. You are always being tested. God is constantly watching how you respond to people, problem, success, conflict, illness, disappointment, even the weather. God, are we, if we look at the life of Abraham, he went through many tests. If we see chapter 12, how Abraham had a test to leave his family. God instructed him to leave his family and obey him and go towards a land, an unknown place. He there had a, with a challenge, a test, whether he's going to let go of his family and just move on. And then we, we got further a test of the famine. When he left, he faced famine. He had another test. How he, is he going to trust God or or is he going to murmur or is he going to go back? And then we also see in chapter 13, Abraham's hurt man and Lot's hurt man had a conflict. And here was a test of conflict. How he handles conflict. How he handles the problems come out. In Genesis 14, he, he had to fight against four armies of the east with only 300 men and few alliances. Abraham had a warfare test. So many times in, Ab in Abraham's life, he experienced different types of tests or trials. So when this came, he had already developed his faith in God. He has already developed his trust in God because he has gone through many tests as God put him. And many of them, he, 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 he aced it tremendously. Some he didn't do very well. But through this journey, he has learned to trust in the almighty God. In James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Some of us don't like these words because we don't like to go to trials. We don't like to go through testing, but only to testing and trials would God be able to test our faith, enlarge our faith, uh, develop perseverance in us that we are able to go the distance. We are able to hold a bigger responsibilities that God has, has in store for us. And this is the sure way that God will take us to. So God takes us through tests to try our faith and discern its composition. How is our faith? Our faith is it strong, not strong, weak? And everything goes. It only shows true. When, when you put gold in fire, then you'll know whether there's impurities. When we are under pressure, then only you see truly whether we are strong in faith or not strong in faith and what are steps we need to take. It is, it is whether it's true, genuine or false, whether it's weak or strong. Furthermore, since God has different plans for us, each one is his children, test can be a preparation for us for the next level. Test can be a place where God reveals to us certain things that we need to let go, leave behind so, so testing is actually a blessing for us, even though it's painful, it's hurting, it's a time of wilderness, it's a time of, of humbling. And many people don't like, but that is what 
takes us from one level of, of, of spirituality to another level, one level of, of, of maturity to another level. But we must remember, I must specify this in the very early, God tests us, but God doesn't tempt us. So never use the word that God tempts us because James chapter 1 verse 13 to 14 says, when tempted, no one will say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone for each one is tempted when by his own evil desires, he is dragged away and enticed. God does not tempt anyone because holy and perfect. However, he does test his believers. God tests the children so that he will know their strength, their faith, their endurance. Satan is the one that comes to tempt us. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says, There had no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So God tests you. And when temptation comes, always remember this. No matter what temptation the devil throws at you, God will help you to overcome. God will not allow the temptation to be too big that you cannot overcome. So I encourage you, keep focusing on God. Keep trusting on God. Keep turning to God. No matter what is it, turn to God. He will empower you. He will give you the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit to be an overcomer. Something very important for us as we hear this sermon is we must be aware that we go through trials. We must be aware that we will face testing. We must be aware the enemy is waiting to attack us and we must rise up. We must have a, a spine of metal. We mustn't be some weakling like a tauge or something that can be blown away. We must know the enemy is planning to attack us. We must more. We go to trials. We go to testing. We go to warfare. And we must be firm. We must be ready. We must be geared up. Sometimes we learn all kinds of wrong teaching where everything will be fine and dandy. The enemy will never do anything. Everything will go well. And when things don't go that well, we, we sometimes end up depressed. I have spoken to certain members who attended ch the churches where they speak where they preach, they preach all the good things on it. They never train them to be strong. They never train, train them to be ready for trials and difficulties. But they just train them that everything God will bless you, God will prosper you. Your life will be a bed of roses and everything else. And when difficulty comes, problem comes, failure comes, they just crumble and they lose faith in God and everybody else. So it's important for us to know testing comes in our life, trials come in our life, but God is always there with us. God will never leave us nor forsake us. God will never allow something that's too big for us that it will envelop us or it will drown us. Amen? So the first point I talk about is, as we look at this text, for us, when we face trials, when we face testing, the first point is so important that you and I, we got to be obedient to God. We got to be obedient to God. Very clearly here, you see in chapter 22, when God told Abraham this instruction that he needs to sacrifice his son Isaac, he needs to go to the land of Moriah and, and the certain mountain needs to climb and there is going to sacrifice his son as a burnt offering. And the Bible says in verse 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning, settled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleft the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place for which God has told him. And the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham said unto his young man, abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again and so forth. Very clearly you see, there's no verse in this text that says Abraham questioned God. Abraham tried to reason out with God. Abraham tried to give different alternatives. No, he clearly was obedient. And that's important for us. When God gives us instruction, sometimes those instructions that God gives us can be painful, can be things that we don't like, can be things that don't make us feel good, can, that, can be instruction that makes us uh, give things out that, that we want to harbor, want to keep. We, we're supposed to help. We're supposed to go here. Your, your time, your money, your talent, your soul. And sometimes we don't like to do it. But the Bible tells us very clearly when you face testing for you to 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 come out come out successfully for you to pass this testing for you to ace this testing for you to be victorious you must be obedient to what God tells you to do simply obey God that's the best lesson you can learn in life is 
take the word and simply obey. If God tells you something, obey. Keep obeying. Even though how impossible it looks, how bleak, how dark, you keep obeying. And eventually you see a light at the end of the tunnel and you see something new, a greater blessing. So I encourage you today. We need to be like Abraham. He was, he simply obeyed. You can either say no or obey. You can either disobey, question, murmur or obey. And here very clearly we see Abraham simply obeyed God. When you don't obey God, what happens? When you don't obey God's instruction, we will open door for the enemy to come and tempt us to come and question us during that time. And not only that, we will lead us into having depression, discouragement, and ultimately sin. To sin in God's test only leads to repeating, repeating the test. You look at the nation of Israel, when they disobeyed God, what happened? They went to the wilderness over and over. They never succeeded until all the people that were above a certain age died in the wilderness and the younger generation came up. So that's what happens when you disobey God. That's why when you are in the valleys, always learn the lessons what God is teaching you. The faster you learn, the faster you come out. Amen. Many times God allows us to go. He wants to train us. He wants to build us. He also wants us to undo certain things and those are things we got to learn or the things he wants to teach us we got to accept it fast we got to learn to be obedient we got to learn to be humble we got to learn to surrender our ego or pride and do what god tells us so disobedience will will bring a lot of pain will bring a lot of discipline will make you go around the wilderness a longer time obedience will bring god's blessing james chapter 125 says but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this not forgetting what he has heard and doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. The doer of God's word receive blessing while the disobedient of God's test will end up with discouragement and depression. So encourage you, the first point, let us be a people that are obedient to God. Don't question. Sometimes the instruction makes no sense. Sometimes the instruction is just illogical to your mind. Sometimes the instructions, I mean, why should I do it, God? You simply do it. You simply do it. And as you do it, you will experience a supernatural experience. God will do things that will blow your mind. The second point is important as the first point. We need to have faith in God. When you're taken through a trials and testing, you've got to be obedient to what God tells you, the instruction that God tells you. The second point is you've got to obey God. You've got to trust Him. You've got to depend on Him. That's why the Bible says in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 17 to 19, uh, uh, describing back the man of faith. And one of the men of faith was Abraham. And he said, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead and whence also received him a figure. So very clearly you see the second point is important. They describe the action of Abraham was by faith. He said by faith Abraham when he was tried offered up Isaac. So the second point is very crucial, very critical for us to be an overcomer for us to, to pass the test, to ace the test and come out more blessed is you must have faith in God. You must have faith in God. That's what Abraham did. He had faith. The Bible says very clearly, the Bible is full of stories about those who had no other choice but to trust in God. And our faith is only as strong as the object of faith. Our faith is only as strong as the object of faith. And what's the object of faith is God. That's why it's important for us to have an intimate relationship with God. That's why it's important for us to know about God. That's why it's important for us to read the Bible, to study the Bible, to know the attributes of God, to, to build a relationship so that, so that your faith is on something solid. If your faith is not on something solid, it, it, it will crumble when difficult this come. That's why I encourage you, know your God. Know your God. Have a relationship with God. And that's why it's important here. He says, faith is only as strong as the object of faith. And that is God. God is completely trustworthy. God never breaks His promises. God does test us and there's a purpose behind that. Remember that. God is a good God. God is a faithful God. God is a miracle working God. God will never leave us nor forsake us. The promise of God, yes and amen. When God speaks, His word will not return to Him. Why? The word will accomplish His purpose. That is God. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's all powerful. He's a miracle worker. He's a covenant keeping God. We must know God. 
You must know God. You must experience God. You must have an intimate relationship, more than a head knowledge. It must be here. You must know your God. And then and then only you can have faith to hold on to Him. No matter what's happening, the whole world might be turning this way and that way. You might be tossed here and there, but you hang on to God. Because why? You know God. Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. <clears throat> you can trust the next chapter because you know the altar. When God tells you to do something, you know it's unknown. Like Abraham had to sacrifice it. He can trust. He can have faith because he knows God. As what we read just now in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19, he said, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and that he had received the promises offered, offered up by his only begotten son, by whom he said that Isaac shall uh, shall thy seed be called? That's what God told him earlier. Isaac, then he said, accounting that God's able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. God is able. He had faith that God even is able to raise him up from the dead. And that's figuratively what happened actually in the end. Even though the, the lamb was provided, but yet uh, figuratively he was raised. Amen? You can... The Bible says in Genesis 22 verse 2, it says, uh, uh, Abraham says, uh, uh, God told Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there for a burnt offering on the mountain. I'll show you. In, in Genesis chapter 22, 3 and 4, it says, and then early next morning, he got up, loaded his donkey, he took him with two of his servants, Isaac, and he cut the wood and so forth and went the distance. And then we see in Genesis 22 verse 7 and 8, and Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham answered, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. What did Isaac think as, as, he, as, as he's been tied up and coming to a realiza realization that he was the sacrifice? There's no indication in the Bible that Abraham hesitated or that Isaac resisted. Talk about a test. There's the, ironically, Abraham's words will be fulfilled in reality that God himself will provide a lamb and that will be later, later on in life. Not only that himself, later on that lamb will be Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb of God given as a sacrificial sin offering for all of us. That's why because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and raised, uh, we raised up at three days, you and I have the assurance of salvation. Abraham passed this test because he had faith in God, because he was obedient to God, because he feared God. Genesis 12, 20, 12, 22 verse 12 says, And I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So if you look at this text, you very clearly see that Abraham had faith. Hebrews 11, 17, he very clearly says, when God tested him uh, by faith, Abraham and God tested him, offered his sacrifice. In James wrote, his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. So many times in life, you and I know the promises of God. You and I might take the promise of the Bible or you might have a prophetic word or God might give you a vision or a dream. You know it, but you do not know how. So what we got to do, we keep running the race, keep trusting in God, keep believing like Joseph believed in God for a dream even though he went through all kinds of difficulties that what we got to do so obedience is important having faith is important hallelujah many people were tested in the Bible we look at first Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 he speaks about it we speak of those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel we are not trying to please God please people but God who tests our heart very clearly it says God tests our heart not Abraham but God tests our heart also Paul sees God as testing our heart and that this testing proves the strength of our faith. Joseph was tested by God, as I mentioned, Psalms 105 verse 17 to 19. He said, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. Joseph went through all kinds of testing. He was beaten by his own brothers. He was thrown in a pit to die. He was sold as a slave. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He was put in jail and eventually was able to interpret a dream and became the second greatest man in Egypt. That is God. God put you through all kinds of testing. You will never see the end at that moment. But what you got to believe, if God said it, you had a dream, you had a vision, you had a word, it's a prophetic word, it's a promise, you're going to hold on to it. How God does it, 
That is God. That's not for us to comprehend because God's ways are higher than our ways. Remember that. Amen. So very clearly here, you look at Abraham, you, Abraham, you realize that he was a man of faith. When the, when he left the two, uh, his helpers back, he very clearly told them in, in Genesis 22 verse 5, he said, he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. He, we will worship and then we'll come back to you. See, he clearly said, we will come back. He had faith that God will miraculously cause his son to come back. And then also when the son asked him, and the son asked him the question in, in verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Each time Abraham answered in faith, believing that God will provide, God will protect, God will do a miracle. And that's how we must be. Through the trials, we must be a people who have faith in God. God is the one. We will come back. He showed his faith. We will come back. Second, he showed his faith that God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. In fact, if you look at this story, uh, Kierkegaard described this story in, in a very different way. He said that Abraham left his worldly understanding behind as he took with him only faith. He left his worldly understanding. He left his logic behind when God gave him, took his, he took with him only faith. Abraham uh, believed the ridiculous. He believed the ridiculous to go and, and sacrifice his son. In fact, uh, a different lady wrote this. She, she said, um, let me read it here. Purity of heart. She wrote about Kier Kierkegaard writes, the most ruinous evasion of all is to be hidden in the crowd in an attempt to get away from hearing from God's wise voice as an individual. He said, this is the most ruinous evasion of all is to be hidden in the crowd in an attempt to get away from hearing God's voice as an individual. Many of us, we, we get lost with the crowd. We get lost with the voices out there and we, we don't hear what God is telling us. And that is the most ruinous evasion of all is to be hidden in the crowd in an attempt to get away from hearing God's wife. Abraham was not such a person. Even though the crowd, the public was against what's happening because if you, if at that time, uh, God's children, there's no way to sacrifice a child. That was in the hidden practice, idolatry, the Canaanite practice. But God, there's no such thing as sacrificing a child. If ethically cannot be done, socially cannot be done. But yet he just obeyed God's voice. And many times for us to do the impossible, we got to learn to shut off all the voices around and simply obey. People will keep on telling you their logical reasoning and they'll try to help you with all their reasoning, but not realizing many times their reasoning can be hindering your step to be obedient to God and receive that miracle. So what is important is hear the voice of God and shut off all the other voices because they're going to create doubts. So, Faith believes and leaves the how in the hands of the Almighty God. So all we have to do when God says go, we go. When God says stop, we stop. When God says give your possession, you give your possession. When going through trials or tests, remember, we must understand God already prepared it. God prepared for Abraham already. God prepared the ram for him already. God prepared him in the earlier days when he had difficulties with Ishmael, mocked him and so forth. And the wife was very upset and asked Ishmael to be, to be, to be taken away from the family and that grieved him. But God prepared Isaac for him. God always prepares ahead. So whatever trials, whatever difficulty, whatever problems you're going through, remember God prepares. Amen. Let's go to the next point. The third point is when you go to trials, when you go to testing, remember God is giving you a fresh revelation of himself. God is taking you to a time of closer intimacy with him, which is you, you don't get it in your normal uh, walk of life, in your normal routine. Only when you go through the pressure, you go through the fire, go through the valleys and, and difficulties is the time when you see God in areas you never saw him before. And here very clearly, um, Abraham saw God as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And that's how Jehovah Jireh got his original word from, from this text. The law of first mention, you know, study a word, you go to the law of first mention, here is first mention. And many times when we go to situations, we will learn. In, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, Abraham had a new experience of God as Yahweh, 
the covenant God. When God called Abraham to leave his family at home, he was Yahweh, the covenant God. And then when God empowered Abraham to defeat the whole four armies uh, from the east, God revealed himself as a shield. Genesis 51, chapter 15, verse 1. Then in Genesis, Genesis 17, verse 1, when God told Abraham he was going to have a child in his old age to, to Sarah, he revealed himself as God Almighty El Shaddai. And you see, many times in each trial we go through, we get to know God's character and person more deeply. In many ways, it's like our close relationship, our deepest and most intimate relationship typically are formed by going through hard times together. In those hard times, we learn to trust them more and learn more about their character. This is just what God desires to do with us to trials and testing. The Lord, as we look at the Bible, there's so many names of God. And every time you go to the situations, in fact, you study the Bible, the people of God experience the character of God differently as they went through different trials and different situations. They experience God as Elohim. They experience God as Yahweh, the Lord and Master. They experience God as El Elyon. It means the Most High God. He used the Most High God, refers to the character of God as above everyone and everything. Describes the position of sovereign majesty. He's El Shaddai. El Shaddai means he's a God who provides, supplies, nourish, satisfies. He's has absolute power, El Shaddai. He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healed us. And then he, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner in Exodus 17, 15. And he goes on, Jehovah Shalom, God is peace. Jehovah, Jehovah Shabbat, the Lord of hosts. And Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd. And many more. So every time you go to an experience, you have an intimate relationship with God. Every time you go to trials, you go to testing, God opens himself to you in a different way. And, and through that experience, you, you develop a, a further intimacy with God. Something that you cannot learn from books. Something you cannot learn from colleges. It only can happen when you have a personal experience with God. Hallelujah. The fourth point is the importance of sacrifice. Here very clearly you see Abraham was instructed to sacrifice his son Isaac. In Romans chapter 12 verse 1 he says, Therefore I urge you brothers or brethren in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. In fact, that is the attitude we have when we sacrifice unto God. It must be an act of worship. A spiritual act of worship. Abraham sacrificed. In throughout the Bible, you learn this, the same phrase repeated. The sacrifice, the sacrifice at temple. Sacrifices went throughout. In the New Testament, we are supposed to be a living sacrifice unto God. And when you sacrifice your life, you sacrifice your time, you sacrifice your, your finances, you give sacrificially, you are surely to get a reward here. And you must have the right attitude. When you sacrifice, you're sacrificing with a heart of worship, not murmuring not complaining but you are worshipping God you're giving the right attitude when you give the right attitude you'll see the blessings coming upon your life the very reason many of us get angry of God at God when going through trials is because we see our life as worship towards our own self we are, if a trial brings pain or discomfort, we get upset because our lives are more, are, are often more about ourselves than God. Our lives are about our success, our happiness, and anything that hinders those goals create anger or animosity within us. However, when we live our lives as a sacrificial worship to God, it will change our responses to tests and trial. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4 says, now, not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. We rejoice in trials because they ultimately lead us to hope in God. So we got to get our eyes today on God. We need to be a people who are willing to be a sacrifice unto God. Willing to people who know the importance of sacrifice. Abel and Cain, the Bible says, Abel gave a sacrifice that pleasing to God. Your sacrifice should be your best. Your sacrifice should be without blemish. Your sacrifice shouldn't be something of leftover. Remember that. You want to touch the heart of God. You need to give your best unto the Lord. Keep giving your best. That's what God deserves. You give your best. 
and God will bless you. Read the Bible. Many times people will bless. Here we see uh, Abraham sacrificed Isaac, but God provided the ram so that Isaac was not sacrificed and experienced God in a new way. Uh, the Shunammite woman, she raised uh, the child. She got a child raised from the dead. She provided food, a place to stay for the, for the man of God. Every time the man of God came, he, she asked him to come and stay in the house and gave him a room and gave him food to eat. And when the man of God was there, he realized he got no children and he prayed over the woman and she was able to conceive. Why? Because start off with a sacrifice. She sacrificed a place. She sacrificed a money. She sacrificed a time for this man of God. And because of that, she was rewarded. And the widows, the prophet's widow, she had no money and how she had to get, she had to pour what she had into the empty battle. She had to sacrifice the last bit of all she had. And by doing that, all the battles became full. She could pay off all the creditors and live on the rest. Again, it talks about sacrificing the, the widow and the child in, in Elijah's time where Elijah said, bake me a cake. She said, a little flour, a little flour, a little oil. She was to bake a cake and die. Elijah said, go and bake me a cake first. She obeyed. She sacrificed what she had for Elijah. And the Bible says the oil and the flour never ended throughout the whole whole family it multiplied and multiplied and he go on and on and how how God uh, set up how the sacrifice of the young lad that gave his five loaves and two fishes uh, and with that 5,000 people were fed the food and they had extra and this is what we are importance of sacrifice we got to learn here a principle of sacrifice as a Christian sacrifice is mentioned throughout the Bible in the Old Testament and New Testament sacrifice is key in the New Testament it says we need to be a living sacrifice so we cannot be people who are selfish and look for self we got to be willing to sacrifice our time sacrifice our energy sacrifice our talent we should sacrifice our money sacrificially give in fact the Bible talks and as you do that God is going to bless you abundantly the fifth point I want to talk about as we look at this testing, a very important symbol here is sacrificing of Isaacs. The Bible here very clearly says that, that Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac. And that was the hardest part because that was his only child. His old age, miraculous, he got his child. And through that child, he's going, the prophecy is going to fulfill. And yet God said you to sacrifice. And if you study the verse in verse 18, in verse 16, let's look at the verse 16. In verse 16, he says, he says in verse 16, and said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, and all the blessings he, 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 he professed over him. It very clearly says, you have not withheld from me your only son, your son, your only son, and because of the blessing. And this was sacrificing his Isaac. And by sacrificing his Isaac, he showed to God his heart that the Isaac in his life is not higher than God. He doesn't have a place more prominent than God. He was willing to sacrifice it as God told him. And because of that, blessings were spoken, which we'll address later. And I want to talk about this here today. As we go through testings and as we go to trials, one of the things that happens in our life during that time is it will come to a place where God deals with us also to sacrifice our Isaac. Isaac symbolically speaks of things that we cherish so much. Isaac is not necessarily an idol made of wood or made of stone, all kinds of weird things. An idol can be something that you put higher than God. An idol is something that gets your time, your love, your preference more than God. And God is telling you that during these trials and during this testing, these idols got to come down. Many idols in our life, our way of thinking, our job, our finances, or many other things, they got to come down in this time because why idols, they are idols. Idols, you put place them above God. Anything is above God got to come down because God is number one in our life. We need to love the Lord, the God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Amen. So this is a very important point I see here where God is teaching us today in times of testing, in time of trial, God is slowly but surely making us realize that there are idols in our life. Idols are not necessarily idols of stone and, and, and wood or anything that we worship there, but things that we have placed in place of God. We have put them up, taken our time, taken our attention, and we have placed them. And that's how I, uh, Abraham had to sacrifice 
Isaac, he said very clearly here, you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And during times of trials, we got to see if there's anything in our life we have placed higher than God. Anything in our life we have given more prominence. Is it our work? Is it our business? Is it our job? Is it our, our hobbies? Is it our car? It can be all kinds of things. Is it your family? Are you putting above God? Whatever it is, you got to come down. You got to keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. God will test us through these trials. God will test us through this period. God will slowly but surely make us release, open our hands to things that you seem is very important. That's not important at all. I want to, I want to um, uh, share about this woman. This a title of message was taken from a, a hymn written by the woman by the name of Frances Havergill. She was a daughter of William Havergill. She was a poet and, and hymn writer she was also a Hebrew and Greek scholar known for her dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. In December 1873, she officially dedicated her life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever way necessary. One of the one of the ways soon will be found out that she visited Holly House, a home where 10 people were there. 10 people were there. Many were non-believers. Some were believers, but were not walking and living uh, a life that is obedient to God. She stayed there five days and she prayed to God that God will lead, lead each and every one to the Lord. And true enough, at the end of five days, each and every one was saved. They either saved or they were revived, the Christians there. Then she wrote these words in this song. She penned these words. This was a song that she wrote. In fact, if you go to YouTube, you can see a singers singing this song that she penned. And the words describe the whole situation there of the people getting saved. And in fact, as she wrote the few lines and she couldn't carry on the next line and she was waiting from the Lord and, and the Lord touched her heart and, and she decided that she had a lot of jewelry. She had a lot of jewelry, about 50 pieces or so she got uh, over time and, and she was convicted. She's going to give the jewel, all the jewelry away. She gave, she, she, she sold it and took the money and gave to a mission home. And that's how she finished the lines of a song. So the song was, take my life, let it be consecrated Lord to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ce ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. <clears throat> Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a bite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall no longer mine. It it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord. I pour it at thy feet. It's treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. This is what she wrote. And, the, and one of the lines I use the title of the message today, not a might should I be told, which she actually did. She sold off everything. And she went to serve the Lord. And that's what sometimes God puts upon our heart. As we go to trials, as we go to testings, God wants us to surrender everything to Him so that He is number one. In, in, in Watchman Nee's book, he's, he wrote this, that we, in one of his books, he wrote, that we approach God like little children with open hands begging for gifts because He is, he is a good God. He fills our hands with good things like health, friends, money, success, recognition, challenges, marriage, children, a nice home, a good job, and all the things that we count at Thanksgiving when we count our blessing. And so like children, we rejoice in what we have received and run around comparing what we have with each other. When our hands are finally full, God says, my child, I long to have fellowship with you. Reach out your hands and take my hand. But we can't do it because our hands are full. God, we can't. We cry. Put those things aside and take my hand. No, we can't. It's too hard to put them down. But I'm the one who gave them to you in the first place. Oh God, what you have asked is too hard. Please don't take us. Don't take us to put. Don't ask us to put these things aside. And God answers quietly. You must. We love our idols. 
in in one of book of Elizabeth Iliad, she, she makes the point that the process of Christian growth is one in which God breaks the idols of our life one by one. Oh, how painful it is because by definition, we love our idols. We protect them because they give us strength, hope and meaning. Rika wrote in one of the books, he said, we have yet begun to destroy idols and we have yet begun to understand symbols. Many of us, even as Christians, we got our own idols. It might but be an idol of wood or stone, but it may be an idol that we have placed and we put great prominence there. Maybe your education, maybe your qualification, whatever it is, and we pride away as our achievement. And today, God wants you to break it. God wants you to break it. Break all your idols. We are not supposed to hold tightly to the things of the world. Hold lightly what you value greatly. Remember that whole lightly what you value greatly because it doesn't belong to you anyway. Every time I say this hits, turn not because everyone knows it's true. We come into life with nothing. We leave with nothing. And that's important for us to remember. In between, God fills our hands with good things and then He asks us to give them back to Him so that He can, we can walk in fellowship with Him. Oh, how painful the process is. I have found in my life and in when we, when we listen to God and give away all and then follow Him. And the sixth point is a great reward after the test. When you have completed the test, when you ace the test, when you pass the test, the Bible says a great reward. And that should be our driving force, our motivation. We know every test, God has something good. I know you're going to have a better experience of God. You're going to have an intimate relationship with God. You're going to have a new revelation of God. Or God's going to prosper you. Or God's going to bless you. Or God's going to take you higher. Or God's going to open new doors. God's going to expand. God's going to enlarge, enlarge your territory. The Bible says very clearly in, in Genesis 22, 15 to 18, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of cities and of the enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. See the blessings we receive every time we go to trials, every time we go to testing, at the end of the road, you are going to be blessed. After God provided the ram for Abraham to sacrifice, he pronounced a blessing of Abraham. He reassured Abraham of his promise to make the descendants like the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore. But he also gave a further promise of the Messiah coming through Abraham's lineage. He said, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. In Galatians 3.16, Paul teaches that the word offspring is singular, referring to Christ. The reward for being faithful in the test was a reassurance, a privilege of the Messiah coming through his lineage. And that is no different for us. When we faithfully navigate through the trials of life, God will open doors unto us that you never fathom or dreamt of. God will expand, God will enlarge, God will favor. So I'll encourage you today, keep your eyes on God. Go to trials with your head held high, with your chin up and believing in God, obeying in God, running the race, knowing that God is something special for you. Job faithfully persevered through trials. God reward him with double blessings. Amen. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man that perseveres under trial because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to go to love him. Not only you receive blessings now, you will receive blessings for eternity when you run. And the last, I'll close my conclusion. I want to compare here the lesson that we see as Abraham offered his son, the father offered his son, Jesus Christ. As Isaac carried the wood, Jesus carried the cross. As Abraham was willing to put his son to death, the father willed that his son should die. The ram was offered in place of Isaac. Christ was offered in the place of sinners. Abraham received his son back figuratively. Jesus literally rose from the dead. This whole description here not only talks about what transpired at that time with Abraham sacrificing, going through testing and coming out victorious. It also refers to what is going to happen in future. 
is a figurative story, is, is, is a symbolic story that describes what Jesus will do. So I encourage you today, no matter what trial you're going through, no matter what testing you're going through, remember God has a plan for you. God allows you to go to situation circumstances because he has a better plan for you. So, and he has a great reward at the end of it. So don't be pressed down. Don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged through all the things happening around you. Oh, you keep your eyes on Jesus. Have faith. Run the race. Stay obedient to God because because God has a plan. Things you got to let go, you let go. The Isaacs that got to, the idols, the Isaac got let go, you let go. So that God can take you deeper and higher. I'm just praying for you. Keep running the race. We serve a good God, a faithful God, a miracle working God. He can create things out of nothing. He will favor you. He will draw people in your life. He will bless you. Just keep your eyes on him. Keep believing. Keep holding on the promises. God bless you. Shalom.